Beneath the well in Kakariko Village has a history. Beneath the village as a whole has quite the loaded history. During the events of Ocarina of Time, the well in Ocarina of Time housed horrors that wouldn't be replicated over the course of the rest of the games. It's probably the darkest area in a Zelda game thematically, especially considering you're exploring this area as a child. In A Link to the Past and A Link Between Worlds, there are entire dungeons located in both the Dark World and Low Rule counterparts respectively, and underneath Kakariko in Twilight Princess is something less sinister, but interesting nevertheless. Ancient script from the Uka. Over the course of the Legend of Zelda timeline, time and time again there has been a mystery hidden beneath Kakariko Village, but nothing has captivated people as much as the bottom of the well. The Era of Wilds didn't allow Link to explore underneath Kakariko Village at all, but it turns out there was a story after all. So today, I want to tell the potential story of the dweller who lived beneath Kakariko Village, going into as much detail as I found out about their story. Let me just say, I have added some of my own headcanon into this to make this a story and not just a telling. This story doesn't begin with the Dweller themselves though, it begins with a man who was changed with time, with the meeting of a woman and with the creation of a family. The Sheikah are known to be a tribe who want peace more than anything else in the lands of Hyrule. Unlike the Hylian royal family, they don't want more power at the risk of future detriment. And unlike the rest of the races of the world, they don't have an itch for power at all. They don't have a need for all of that because they were birthed into this world for one sole purpose, to be the divine protectors of the Hylian royal family, and far more prominently, the princess of Hyrule, Zelda. And that's true for every single incarnation of the Sheikah. They want peace for Hyrule and peace for the princess above all else. And only until recently in the timeline, that was the tribe's only purpose. It had their undivided attention. Years and years before the Era of Wilds, there was a shakeup within the tribe. Certain members of the Sheikah didn't want to only stop serving their purpose, some suddenly wanted to directly oppose the tribe's initial reasoning for being, and in turn, oppose the will of the goddess. While I don't think we know much from the people who initially split from the clan, we do know that they formed a brand new tribe all to themselves, and worked on the magic that they were given through birth, creating the Yiga tribe. Years passed and the Yiga are on the cusp of achieving their goal. The calamity has returned, but it's not been set onto the world just yet. It's going to need a little bit more help. With Zelda being the only hindrance to the calamity, they had to figure out the princess's purpose for opposing the puppet version of the king, because there was no way that she could beat the calamity. She had to be stalling for whatever reason. A foot soldier tells a story he was told of the Hero of Wild sleeping for the last 100 years, somewhere in Hyrule, but he's not entirely sure of where he's sleeping just yet. The tribe search far and wide for the hero, but this story isn't anything to do with the hero. It's nothing to do with the princess or Ganondorf. This is the story of one person, and that person's family. Dorian was a Yiga soldier when he was a younger man, but as these rumblings of the hero reawakening were starting to stir, he also found his beautiful wife, his brand new reason for being. She hailed from Kakariko village, she represented peace in the world. And with the wife came his children, the light of his life for years to come, both Kotla and Koko. It was at this point that the soldier started to realise that he was born into this clan. Over his time as a soldier, he never did stuff that he truly meant to and wanted to do. He never did things for reasons that he truly believed in. He did it because he had to. This is evident by the fact that, from our knowledge, the Yiga clan don't have cared for families. New members of the clan have to be birthed, but a couple of years after birth they're likely told to start training to become a soldier. There doesn't even seem to be any care from one Yiga to another, except for Master Koga who is the chief of their tribe, which means he has to demand the respect of the rest of his tribe. We haven't really seen any of the eras where the Sheikah were a force to be reckoned with in combat, we just know some of the good Sheikah magic wielders in the past. So. I'm not entirely sure of this, but I'm pretty sure that the Sheikah would treat their children with respect as they grow up, lest they lose sight of their reason for living. And for the sake of his wife and his growing family, the torn Dorian decided that he needed to leave the Yiga clan. In a rush, the family packed their bags and made for one of the safest places in all of Hyrule for them, Kakariko Village, the home of the Sheikah tribe, in an effort to change their ways and become part of a more peaceful being. Upon arriving at the village, we don't know whether Impa questioned the man, but it's likely that she did considering she was the chief of the tribe at that point in time, and realised that Dorian did have pure intentions, but to make sure of his loyalty, she would make him one of the guardians of the chief's house at the foot of the village, paired with Kado, a talented archer and presumably a formidable warrior, so if anything seemed awry, he could deal with the former Yiga man. While Dorian was given a suitable home for his family, 
he realised that the eagle would come for him, and if he found him there, they would do something awful to whether it be him, his wife, or his kids. He'd much rather take the hit than his family. So, in what seemed like an odd request, Dorian asked Impa if it wouldn't be too much weight on her mind if his family, and notably the wife who already lived in the village, could live in the well near the top of the village. He noticed it was very out of the way and clearly hadn't been used in addition with water for many years. It was the perfect place for his family to hide from the eager should they come knocking. The father had a plan. He'd hide the family for a year, and the tribe would have likely forgotten his face by the time his children and wife came out of the well. The plan was foolproof. Even if the Yiga found him with their sworn enemies, he'd either take the beating and potentially could die, or he'd lie to them and say he was working as a spy, though he knew the latter plan probably wouldn't work. For a time, this plan worked just as intended. He gained the trust of Impa, and you can even see how much he cares about the village and its people in the journal entry discussing how Picango shouldn't find the ancient shrines near the village and he doesn't think that's right since it should be the hero who finds them. While Dorian was tending to his new duties as a guardian of the chief's house, his family lay underneath the village in the hopes that their efforts wouldn't be in vain, that they could truly escape the dreaded Yiga tribe. Down in that well, that dank stinky well, Dorian's wife, Kotler, and Coco awaited for their time to come out of their hiding place. The wife made note of some of her most precious thoughts while she was in there, how her husband always worked so hard and was so honoured to have the task of protecting both Impa and Paya. She talks of days with her children and their, their favourite foods, and how she'd happily take bee stings just to ensure that her and Dorian's children were eating happily. Despite taking refuge in a cold, dank well, she tried her best to keep the family together. In this time, it seemed that the woman learned a lot of valuable life lessons too, like creating her own stove and even making and nurturing her own farm underground. Truly, she couldn't have been a better wife. Time passed, and it seemed like the Yiga clan might not find the family, so one day, whilst collecting resources and seeds for her children, she heard a sound. She wasn't sure of what it was, so she carried on toward her goal, a tree with a big bee's nest. She knew how much her children loved honey, and she couldn't wait to see the smiles on their faces when she returned back to their newfound home. This would be the last thought that she'd ever have. In an instant, a Yiga blade master had run a wind cleaver directly through the woman's heart and twisted the blade, the final remnants of the woman being left in the memories of a loving husband who had done so much for her, Dorian, and her two cherished daughters. After a long day's work, Dorian checked in on his family as he usually did at the end of his shift, but something wasn't right. His wife wasn't anywhere to be seen. He ran at his daughters and asked where their mother was, but they didn't know. And, and worse, they said that she'd been missing since 11am. Right now, it was midnight. Dorian feared the worst. He told the girls to stay put and went out searching for the missing woman. He knew that she liked to gather resources from the Rabia Plain just north of the village, so he made his trek through the village, past the closed Great Fairy Fountain and past the Lineru Road West Gate. There, he would see his wife, motionless, on the floor, next to a group of trees. He ran to her aid, felt her, and nothing. She was gone. As he sat sobbing next to her, he heard footsteps creep up behind him. You knew what would happen if you tried to betray us. Dorian shot to his feet and pulled his blade, still speechless. You're going to tell us everything that's discussed in the village, and I need a way into the shrine nearby. Don't mess this up. If you do, it's Imper and Pius heads, followed by your children. The blade master disappeared into the night. Dorian collapsed on the ground into a ball of tears. He awoke for days and days after, having to become the person he wanted to leave behind. He told the current Yiga soldier of the heirloom and various discussions around the village. By this point, Cutler and Coco were starting to grow slightly older and they had a house to themselves and their father. Finally, Dorian had had enough. At the dead of night, the former Yiga member made the climb on the northern side of the village to their usual meeting place with the Yiga soldier. Knowing the master's tricks by now, Dorian called him out. Your usefulness has come to an end, as must you. The blade master uttered to the man. Dorian realised that his time was probably over. His final thoughts were that he hadn't been the perfect man, but he had tried his best, as he prepared for a final bout with the soldier. Then there was a sudden shift in the air. The blade master's eyes darted to Dorian's left. But first, it appears we have an audience. There stood Link, the swordsman that acted for the royal family. For my fallen master! After only a few mere moments, the fight was over, and Link stood supreme. Dorian could live another day to see his children grow, and it was all thanks to Link. 
Although he would never forgive himself for putting his wife in harm's way, there was nothing that could ever repay the debt that the man owed Link. But the dweller whose notebook is found underneath the village would stay a ghost. Dorian just hoped that her soul would rest in peace, and so he left her notebook down there and let her spirit live on inside of the rest of the family. This is one of the many people that Link has touched emotionally over both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, and I hope you'll join me to listen in on some more stories like this in the future. Extra special thanks to fellow Zelda creator Zinc for bringing in the dastardly Blade Master to life. My Patreon supporters are on screen right now, and they're great people for what they do for me, with some GN Jared Whedon helping the channel out to a crazy degree. I hope you keep enjoying the game, as I am, and I'll see you all next week. Please do stay safe.